Hi, y'all. So let's talk a little bit about Kraut and his Muppet Farm. Academics, please respond. So as you know, I was going to do a series of videos responding to their, uh, well, let's call them brainstorming sessions. But then something happened and I was left sitting there staring at my computer thinking, well, that de-escalated quickly. So instead of doing a series of uh, videos responding to their scheming and plotting to take on the the evil people who believe that there exists such a thing as human races, um, I'm going to do one video where I touch on some of the highlights that would have uh, I would have gone over among some other things. And, and these are just points that shouldn't go uh, without being mentioned as, I guess, as a way of a parting shot in, in the case of, uh, well, the crumb of the crop. So, <clears throat> I want to talk about their failings. And I don't mean here just their, like, planning and scheming moral failings, though that's going to get talked about a lot by a lot of other people. But to the academics who were cooperating in this little scheme, let me just say that in addition to failing at the trivium, you suck with the grammar, you suck with the logic, and you want to go straight to the rhetoric, you also have not learned from history. Kraut named it Operation Mincemeat. If there's anything that you should know, if you learned anything from World War II, it should be that when there is an Operation Mincemeat, it always redounds negatively for the Germans. So don't get involved with the Germans in an Operation Mincemeat. They lose on that score, so history seems to show. And also, on the spying and the counterintelligence ops and all that, also World War II with Johnny Jepsen and uh, Dujon Popoff and the Obvier, you should learn that the Germans suck at spycraft. Don't get involved with the Germans at spycraft. It's not going to go well for you. But let's talk a little bit about science issues and some mathematics and some logic. There is one thing that is uh, true about everyone who was involved in that, uh, whose uh, recordings I've listened to, and it's they have two really impressive uh, levels of consistency. They are consistently unable to notice a logical structure of an argument, but they are nevertheless consistently able, and you'll find this surprising, I'm sure, to notice logical fallacies that haven't been committed. So I have to applaud them for being that wrong that frequently. It must take a little bit of work. But since I know credentials are so important to them, I thought that I would read uh, on the notion of race from two biologists, uh, Jerry Coyne and Greg Mayer. And the reason I've chosen these people isn't simply because their argument is congenial to mine, but it's because they're very much on the left wing of politics. This is another problem with Kraut and crew is that uh, they seem to think that race realism and the alt-right are, in some sense, wed together. Uh, the, the whole the problem with science, for those of you in Kraut's Muppet Farm, is that if you look at a distribution of how education goes across the planet, you look at like um, uh, religious distributions versus scientific distribution of how knowledge spread throughout the world, you'll notice that Religion is contained within boundaries, borders of countries, and scientific knowledge isn't. And the reason for that is that facts are stubborn things. Logic is logic and mathematics is mathematics. And once you can show it, uh, it, it becomes perverse to deny the truth of the proposition. Now, in their case, they have a political viewpoint, and they are unable to distinguish X is a fact that is amoral. Facts are what they are, saying that the Second World War existed is not an argument that we should have had a second world war or that we should engage in future world wars. It is an amoral fact. It is something that happened. Uh, what you choose to do with that fact is the political uh, component. And they are unable to separate these two distinct issues. If X is a fact and some people believe X because of certain person's political, political viewpoints, they will try to push for one set of policies they don't like. Therefore, to stop the bad political effects that we don't like, We'll just deny science, we'll deny logic, and we'll deny facts. So I'm going to read from Jerry Coyne. Uh, he, his academic pedigree is very well credentialed. He comes from the Theodosius Dobzhansky, Dick Lewinton line. Um, Dick Lewinton was his PhD advisor. So anyway, uh, Jerry Coyne has to say this on races. In my own field of evolutionary biology, races of animals, also called subspecies or ecotypes, are morphologically distinguishable populations that live in allopatry, i.e. are geographically separated, or more particularly were in their ancestral past. That's not so much true anymore because people move around a lot more now than they used to. There is no firm criterion on how much morphological difference it takes to delimit a race. Races of mice, for example, 
are described solely on the basis of difference in coat color, which can involve only uh, one or two genes. Greg Meyer comes by and writes another article on biology and races, and he says, so here in a nutshell is what biology has to say about race. To begin with, race is not, not a technical term in biology. This, this was an argument that was brought up by several of them, because my definition like, oh, that's a subspecies, uh, and we'll go to Wikipedia, because, you know, that's what scientists do, and we'll get the Wikipedia definition, we'll notice these taxonomic ranks, and they don't have that one listed there. They failed to notice that this is a, that was a listing of major taxonomic ranks, not all the in-between ones. And if you go look below species, you'll see, I don't know, 15, 20 different terms that are used to describe different types of populations below the species level. They're not listed officially like this means that, this means the other. Biologists use them kind of loosely and interchangeably. Genetic population, continental population, geographic race, race, breed, tribe, all of these uh, haplogroup, all of these are kind of loosely used interchangeably. They have approximately the same uh, understanding. Not exactly the same in all cases, but approximately the same. Now, some people have mentioned to me that I should use a more technically sounding word because if, well, this wasn't his argument, but it's my response to it. I don't do a great deal of jargon. I speak to be understood, and the thicker the diction becomes, the less well an idea is going to spread. If your goal is to communicate, you shoot yourself in the foot by choosing obscure words that no one's ever heard of, or that almost no one's ever heard of. If I really, really wanted to be very rigorous, I would go write a paper and put it up on, like, archive, and then all of three people would read it and they'd go, hey, that's pretty smart. No one's ever going to see this. No one's ever going to understand it. Look at all that notation. That's why in my videos where I do mathematics, unless my video is specifically about teaching mathematics, I don't include a great deal of notation. I avoid it because mathematical notation is a barrier to communication. It is another type of language that people have to learn, and it is an obstacle to understanding the point. So I don't uh, weigh people down with all the obscure recondite bits of academia. So anyway, uh, Greg Mayer goes on. It is loosely uh, used for any differentiated subdiv subdivision of a species. For example, there's a fruit fly in Wisconsin that feeds on hawthorn and apple, and, uh, and the flies that feed on the different trees are somewhat different, and so people refer to the hawthorn race and the apple race. Uh, it goes on. In zoology, the term geographic race does have a well-defined meaning. So here we're going to parse between race and geographic race. Let's just say race. You know, the thing that people for thousands of years have instantly noticed about people from different lands, that there are some differences to be noticed. Anyway, it means, uh, if you, it, it means that if you look at an individual of a species, you can tell where it is from, or conversely, that you can tell me where, that if you can tell me where the individual is from, I can tell you what it looks like. So, in this uh, quest to use like some weird, peculiar term that uh, is made up just to talk about humans, because humans are so different from all the other animals and the plants and everything, that we've got to have a special term so that way people don't get confused, they're going to play this game. And it is simply uh, that if you can, if you say that a person's background is from here, you're going to know roughly what they look like. If you tell someone roughly what someone looks like, you're going to know where their ancestry is from. This is the great test that seems to work perfectly well for biologists. Anyway, geographic races, if they were given taxonomic names, are called subspecies. With regard to humans, most of the genetic variability, I'm skipping ahead, is within populations, not between local populations of race or races. This was pointed out by Dick Lewinton in 1972. Dick, of course, was Jerry's dissertation advisor and my jury advisor. However, just because most of the variation was with, is within populations doesn't mean you can't tell where someone is, fr is from by looking at him. The geneticist Tony Edwards later called the mistaken notion that a majority of variation being within populations precludes identification of population membership Lewinton's fallacy. Note alt hype it's Lewinton, not Lewontin. Anyway, as a former student of Lewinton's, I'm not especially fond of Edwards' choice of term, but nonetheless, Edwards is entirely correct. It is of crucial importance to note that the scientific questions asked by Lewinton and Edwards were different. Lewinton asked, what proportion of genetic variation in the analysis of variance sense, variance sense in humans is within and among populations? The answer is roughly 85% within, and the rest between is among local populations and races. Uh, that is the answer Lewinton gave in 1972, and it is entirely correct. Uh, confirmed by much more molecular data since that time. Edwards asked, <clears throat> Can individual humans be assigned to races from genetic data? Or alternatively, can human races be diagnosed, diagnosed in the taxonomic sense of subspecies? 
The answer is yes, they can. Edward shows that his answer to his question is entirely compatible with Lewontin's answer to Lewontin's question. There is no doubt whatever that this can be done, and I'm going to go further. And, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins will point this out to you, too. If you hand people like uh, pictures of people from different places, you can sort them, even if you don't know, uh, ge if you're not good at geography, you can sort them into the appropriate groupings. Humans do this very well, and we do it with about the same degree of accuracy that we're able to distinguish male from female. It's not perfect, we make errors, but it's pretty, uh, a pretty good guide for you know, using a monkey brain. If you look at the genetic data, uh, the, criti the critical variable there is the number of loci that are used to distinguish the populations. If you, if you I think it's like 100 loci, you'll have about a 30% error rate. If you go up to 1,000 loci, you'll have about a 10% error rate. But if you, there's enough information between the different groups that if you use a sufficiently large number of loci, you will be able to sort people without error, per effectively without error. You know, there could be coding errors or someone could put the wrong number here, but, but assuming every you know, perfect humans were doing the process, you could do it essentially without error. That's how much information is contained in that 15%, which makes a great deal of sense when you consider that, uh, you know, we're not all that different. It's like less than 2% of our genome distinguishes us from our nearest uh, primate cousin. And just in that 2% is everything here. And all the people who accept that, uh, you know, our big brain is a result of evolution and it's what distinguishes us from the other animals and that we have this lineage shared in common with our cousins, you know, tracing back and back and back, that this was caused by environmental attrition and sexual selection over a long period of time, will magically deny it when there are, uh, for a shorter period of time, geographically isolated reproducing, species, re reproducing populations of humans. They are making the creationist argument about microevolution versus macroevolution. Oh, sure, we believe in microevolution, but there's no such thing as macroevolution. The only component there is the amount of time involved. The geographic races were not separated long enough to become different species, but they were separated long enough to develop some morphological distinctions, which uh, can be noted. That's why there are, for example, drugs that are designed specifically for black people, not for white people. It's because there is information that is there and there are distinctions between the races that, that if you're going to be a competent, compassionate, ethical medical provider, you need to be aware of. So too the differences between men and women. But anyway, uh, let's get on to some talk about the logical problems that they had. The problem with Kraut is he's not well educated. And as I mentioned, the scientists and science students who were working with him were setting him up for failure. Uh, if you think about the trivium, it's grammar, uh, then logic, then rhetoric. Kraut's not well educated at all, so he doesn't even have the grammar, let alone the logic. He wants to get straight into the rhetoric. You just spoon feed him all the words to say, and he'll do the rhetoric part. You, you take that up a level to the students and some of the, even some of the PhDs they had. Uh, they have the grammar, but clearly they're lacking in a logical understanding, and so they want to skip that step and get straight to the rhetoric, to the persuasion part. Uh, guys, you shot yourselves in the foot over and over again. One of the examples was they don't understand causality implications and inference, causality arrows and inference arrows, the, the direction that each of these goes. So I will advert to the existence of a phenotype from which I will infer both genetic and environmental factors. And then they hear that as thinking, I'm saying the phenotype causes the genes or causes the environment or whatever. So we need to talk about causality. Events in the world in, are broken into two major categories, events of the first type and events of the second type. The events of the first type are of such a kind that they proceed or sometimes possibly occur simultaneously with events of the second type, and events of the second type exist in such a fashion that they depend on the existence of events of the first type without which they would not exist. We call events of the first type causes and events of the second type effects. So it goes to cause to effect and some effects can th themselves be causes of some new effect and so the arrow goes like that. Cause effect, ca you know, just put a little C of there, cause effect, cause effect, cause effect. And actually it should be more effective, more like uh, cause and several consequent effects will occur. You infer going the other direction the existence of an effect implies the existence of its cause. So for every effect, there is a cause which preceded it. Um, 
And so if we take something that's completely unobjectionable, hopefully, I hope I don't have like any phlogiston theorists or whatever here, uh, we're going to talk about fire. So if you think about fire, fire is an effect that has three component causes, uh, each of which is necessary and no two of which are sufficient. We'll discuss this more in turn. So you need oxygen, you need uh, a fuel supply, and you need a heat source. Uh, if you just have oxygen, not sufficient to produce a fire. If you just have fuel, not sufficient. If you just have heat, not sufficient. Um, without the existence of any one of these necessary conditions, fire will not occur. Now, um, if they had asked me, I would have suggested to them a philosopher of science, uh, Gary Edwards, who could have helped them understand the, the underpinnings of logic. Because they come by and they like to spout, they like to read through the, the you know, like the website, like, your logical fallacy is, and then they'll read something, they'll go, oh, this looks similar to that, I'll just spout it out. And so they'll say things like, correlation does not imply causation, which is true so far as it goes. Tr uh, co correlation does not imply causation, uh, has the use of imply there, which is the logical use, which means logically requires, or that the x logically if x implies y, it means y is a logical consequence of x, such that the existence of x guarantees the existence of y. Anytime you find x, it's not possible not to also find y. So the way that we detect causes, however, is related to correlation. Correlation doesn't imply causation, However, correlation is evidence for causation. Not conclusive, but it is evidence for it. And the way that we detect causation is by what's known as constant conjunction. The fact that uh, if you have two events, and no matter what you do, you can't disentangle, you can't separate something from it, then, one of, then they exist in a causal relationship, such that either the effect always implies some particular uh, prece precedent condition, or some sufficient condition always implies some effect. So anytime you see a fire, you instantly infer, because it's logically required, all of its necessary uh, causes. You infer the existence of oxygen. I don't know why I made that a Q. For quoxygen. Um, <clears throat> you infer the existence of some type of fuel, and you infer the existence of some type of heat source. Now, even together, these three necessary conditions aren't alone sufficient. You've got to have a fourth condition, which I'll touch on in a minute. But let's think about a fuel source. It could be petroleum, it could be a wood, paper, uh, it could be a plastic, it could be, it, who knows what it is, and a heat source. It could be a match, it could be a lighter, it could be friction, that's how you start a match after all, friction. It could be a lightning strike, it could be a chemical reaction. So here the necessary causes for these two are categories of things which must be true, and when you get the particulars in that category and you put it all together, then, taken in conjunction, you have a sufficient cause, which is to say that when these things are all put together, you produce fire. Now, the, these other conditions I mentioned is the, the, in the fuel source and the heat, the fuel supply and the heat source, is that the heat source has, has to be of such a type that it's able to uh, meet the flashpoint of the fuel, uh, whatever the source of fuel is. So necessary conditions or those necessary causes are those things which must be true without which it's not possible for fire to exist. That's why you can put out a fire by extinguishing any one of this triangle. For example, in World War II, in the interior compartments of ships, the way that they would put out fire when they were bombed is by using carbon dioxide. It's denser than the oxygen, so it goes underneath the oxygen and it creates a, a small layer between the fuel and the heat source and it puts out the fire. You can't do that with the forest fire because you know you throw out some carbon dioxide and the breeze just blows it away and you're like well that's not that's useful not useful so you've got to figure out other ways to take out one of the legs for example you you don't use water on a fuel fire you use a particular kind of foam whereas you can use water on like a wood fire so there are different ways that you can take out a necessary condition but that depends on the sufficient condition the sufficient cause that you're fighting with. I'm sorry if I, if I use cause and condition here interchangeably, but because I'm doing both causality and logic, it's going to happen. I'm sorry. So, there's another set which are of causes or conditions which are contributing. And these exist in such a type that they are insufficient, non-redundant, unnecessary, but in conjunction nevertheless sufficient to produce the effect. 
Gary Edwards could have explained all of this to you guys in great detail. He could explain to you deductive nomological models and, their, uh, and the validity of a deductive nomological model or other mathematical models and how once you get the model you can deduce from here to here to here to here to get some conclusion. But the validity of the model depends upon inductive reasoning and that's the empirical aspect of science where you're comparing your model against what happens in the real world. The support for the model comes from the real world, but how the model works is deductive. It, it's just logical. So you have all of that. Uh, you can take out oxygen, the fire goes away. You take out the heat source, fire goes away. So uh, the, the, that's necessary conditions and sufficient conditions and these uh, so-called Inus conditions. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about something that is apparently controversial. You know, the, the fact that is blatantly obvious to every sighted person. Uh, that there are differences between geographic populations of people that you can notice right away. And this is, for any phenotypic trait, there are two component causes, each of which is necessary, neither of which is sufficient to produce, neither alone is sufficient to produce the phenotype. So the phenotype is the outcome of genetic factors and environmental factors. If you have no genes, you have no phenotype. If you have no environment, whatever that means, I guess no universe, no, you, know, you have no phenotype. So you knock out either one of those, the phenotype, just like the fire, ceases to exist. So those are your extinct species. No more genes, they're gone. Um, now we're going to switch from looking at causality to just logic. And so I'm going to rewrite this. Um, I'm going to be light on the mathematics here because I don't want this to be too weird. Uh, for people who haven't taken a great deal of math. But there is going to be some math in it. When you want to talk about th this phenotype, it equals the, the sum total of all of your genetic factors, your genetic contribution to the one whole phenotype, and all of the environmental factors to one whole genotype. And then there's a third thing, which I'm leaving out for simplicity, uh, but I'm going to put it over here, and because it's, it's evolution and it's all red and blood and tooth and uh, claw and everything, it's the interaction, it's the feedback between genes and the environment. And this is, well, all that's crucial. There's an American jurist who was, he was a law professor named uh, uh, Thomas Reed Powell, and he was once asked to describe the legal mind. And he said, uh, if two things are inextricably linked, and you can think of the one thing without thinking of the other thing, then you have the legal mind. That's the analytic mind more generally. In mathematics classes, we often want to, we'll get some complicated equation or formula or whatever it is, and we'll take out one piece of it to discuss one day in a class. And then, you know, you talk about another piece another day. It's artificial to take that out. We take it out and pretend away the rest of it for the sake of looking at how that operates within the model. But there's a reason on your tests, if, you, if you're doing, I don't know, like adding speed or whatever, and you end the test with 30, you know, asks for the speed and you say 35, you get that marked off as wrong. is because you've got to recontextualize the different pieces that you've pulled out for the analytic reasons. You've got to put them back into the framework they come out of in order for it to be sensible. So it's not 35, it's 35 miles per hour, fevers or whatever it is. If you don't put the units on there, then you have not done the problem in the context of the problem you're trying to solve. You've just looked at the pieces of the math. And this leads, when you fail to do that, the reason mathemati mathematicians grade like this is to train scientists to always recontextualize their models back into the framework, the full framework of the problem they're trying to solve. Failing to do that, which happens a lot, will lead you to say stupid things like what Thunderfoot said when he says, oh, the genes are just a bit player. Not true. When you talk about an extreme environmental condition, you've got to remember, what, what makes it extreme? The, the genes of the organisms that live in it. It is extreme with with respect to what that organism can handle. Uh, there's a reason why walking from your living room outside doesn't kill you, but stepping from, you know, the top of the water to under the water will. It's because one environment is extreme for you. It's not an extreme environment. There's no such thing as an extreme environment. It's an extreme environment in relation to something else. You've got to remember that all of this is in there at every step of the way. When you find, like, uh, you know, if someone gets an arm lopped off, that's an acquired characteristic, but 
the reason that that phenotypic that, that phenotype looks the way that it is, it's very easy to say, oh, that's just the environment. No, it's not. Because there are animals that you can look at in nature, you lop off one of their, their limbs, it grows back because their genetic potential allows for that. So that environmental condition only has the effect that it has because of what your genes can do and cannot do. And when you forget that, you're going to start saying stupid shit. Now, what we're interested in here in finding is average changes between two populations. So what we're looking for is the variance of this, which is just the variance of this sum, which is the sum of the variances. So it's going to be the unique variance of G plus the unique variance of E. I'm going to forget about this for a minute. Plus two times the covariance of the two. So we need to think about environmental conditions here. And we're going to leave off this feedback bit here um, for a moment. The, uh, this, by the way, just gets writ rewritten as, actually, just V of P because it, it's easier. So it's uh, V of P equals G plus E plus two times the covariance of G plus E. <coughs> now, you can think about environmental factors and genetic factors in a couple of different ways. There's a lot that's embedded in here. So, for example, in the environment, because you're looking at different, you're looking at changes, you have shared environment and unshared environment. So, that's really a component of a shared environment plus an unshared environment, which is called E. I guess you can't see that. Now, the way this, what happens here, let me erase this, these lines up here, is that when you start breaking this down into its components, the equation that comes from this, and by the way, uh, the difference in the sum of that, people will know is, if you go look at generalized blocking, it's in there. Uh, this is where it becomes experimentally uh, difficult to deal with all this simultaneously, is because the covariant terms grow at a rate, at an upper bounded rate of n minus 1, uh, your variables grow at a rate of n for a total uh, number of terms in the equation at n minus 1 plus n. So it can get very unwieldy very, very quickly. So to uh, deal with g plus s plus e, that's going to be plus 2 times the covariance of uh, gs plus 2 times the covariance of uh, G, E. But your genetic factors are broken down into three different things, three major different things. So those are, and this is, I'm, I'm just going to get simpler here, just a second, I promise. So your variability of the phenotype is uh, and then plus, you know, all the covariances for a total of 15 terms long, so this equation would take up my whole board a couple times over. <clears throat> now, the Kraut and T crew, his Muppet farm, want to say that if and only if you find the, the genes from molecular studies can you say that there is a genetic cause to uh, the, the uh, average IQ differences between two given, two, two given populations. That's bullshit, and here's why. So here are your environmental conditions. By the way, the reason this is called E for unshared is because it's both un your unshared environment and uh, the error. But we'll put it off to the side. So this stands for additive genetic factors, dominance factors, and epistatic factors. If they're right, then Mendel is wrong. This here is Mendel. This is where he did his work. So he didn't know anything about this equation. It didn't exist. This didn't come about until... The, sometime after World War II, I think the 50s. <clears throat> if they're right, then Mendel should not have been able to do his work. But he's accounted for here. This is where the quantitative genetics is happening. And this is kind of like what molecular biologists are looking at now. Your additive effects deal with your continuous phenotypic traits. Tra traits that can take on, uh, complex traits, traits that can take on any value. So they're continuous. Um, your epistatic ones deal with the com how one gene will interact with either one other gene or some complex, some network of genes, 
and you can get different kinds of effects. You can get, uh, they can act antagonistically, they can act synergistically, that is they can, it can attenuate or it can uh, amplify, so it moderates uh, the expression of uh, the genes. <clears throat> we don't need to know any of this or any of that to discuss this complex trait issue here, and um, they like to talk about getting Thunderfoot and Concordance. Well, I would have recommended, since they wouldn't take my, my Gary Edwards advice on getting you know, some help with the logic, you could at least look at Concordance's throughput here on YouTube. When he first got on YouTube, he made like a little So You Want to Be a Scientist video. Here is uh, my advice for what you should do, and he mentioned in there some excellent advice. <clears throat> Pay attention during your calculus classes. Very important. <clears throat> and the reason for it is this. It's not simply... Um, the, can you take a derivative, or can you compute an integral, or can, you know, you've got to be able to do all that. But there are also concepts that will serve you well in your scientific career. And there, there are several theorems that I was thinking about using to explain this point, but I chose this one because it, it does it um, <clears throat> the easiest, it's the most straightforward, and it's also the most on point. So, we're not going to do actually any math here, anything, we're just going to draw uh, some axes here. So that's your x-axis, your y-axis. And if you have some interval from here to here, so you've got some interval, and within that interval, perhaps outside of it, but we're only, we only care about within the interval, there lives a function. It is continuous. And it exists somewhere on this graph. Don't know where. All we know is that it exists between here and there. There's a theorem that allows you to show that between the output values the function must take on every value between them within this interval somewhere, but you know not where. So if, uh, let me redraw this. I'm gonna blow, note, uh, this is FBI, this is not terrorism, I'm just gonna blow up the graph. So here's our interval. We'll say we start at some point A and end at some point B. And the function starts here, and it ends there. So, when we're talking about the, this is called the intermediate value theorem, it says that between this height and that height, somewhere in this interval, it, the function must take on every value from here to there. So these are your values over here. So that's going to be f of a and f of b. The intermediate value theorem says that somewhere in here is f of c. It's some, it's some value. Uh, of, there's some value, and somewhere between A and B it will reach that, and that'll be at some point C. Kraut and all of his scientists are saying, no, this is wrong. You cannot infer what happens here between there and there unless you know the exact point at which this uh, it reaches this value. So let me erase this so it doesn't get too, com too messy. It could be a straight line. Could be. Still, you, you choose any height on here, you're going to go over and you're going to find some value for the function at uh, some corresponding input value. Well, okay. So it could, be, it could be something simple like that. You could be modeling cricket chirps against temperature. You could be modeling predator-prey models against each other, which is very interesting. We'll come back to that later. Uh, you could be modeling any number of things. It doesn't particularly matter what. All that matters is that the function is continuous. Once you know it's continuous, you know what it must do. But here's what it doesn't say. The, the function could do this. <clears throat> I'll just change my point there to make it work, because I'm not a very good artist. It says that you know that it reaches every value in there at least once. It could reach it, it could hit it many more times. So this value here, it, it reaches the value, uh, it reaches it there, it reaches it here, there, there, and I think right there. So it, it hits it five times. The fact that you can deduce that it hits it at least once doesn't exclude it's hitting it more times. My battery's about to die, so let me get this, let me get over, this over quickly. Um, <clears throat> you can prove that very rigorously. So, on the predator-prey model, since I don't have time to finish that explanation, <clears throat> let me just skip ahead and say, in respect of predator-prey models, when you think about what depends on what, the prey depends upon, like, vegetation. So your deer depend on grass to eat. And your predators de depend upon the prey, who in turn depend upon the grass, which means that your 
Predators depend upon the grass once removed, essentially. But here's the rub. The grass depends upon the predators keeping the prey, I'm sorry, the predators keeping the prey in check because the prey are in turn the thing that eats the grass. If they overgraze the land, then that's not good for the land. And then the predators, uh, sorry, the uh, prey die off. And when the prey die off, the predators die off. This is why predator-prey models get complicated. And it's all embedded up in that interaction between genes and environment. There's nothing about your phenotype that doesn't have those necessary qualities because they are always there. It just gets complicated. And the more chains back from that first thing I showed you, inferring backwards, it gets harder and harder to pinpoint causes in the distant chain backwards. But they are still there, to, whether or not you can uh, find them very exactly. So the logical problem is that Kraut and his Muppet farm, all of his idiotic scientists, are saying that if you can't show at what where C, F of C is, the exact points at which it exists, then you cannot say that it happens within there. This is completely categorically false. One monkey, one marker, come at me, motherfuckers. You aren't smart enough. Have a great day.